Hi there. Welcome back to History and Philosophy of Science and Medicine. I'm Matt Brown. Today is part three of our discussion of Feyerabend's book, Against Method. Uh, and we're talking primarily about chapters 15 and 16 and the uh, interstitial appendices there. So in these chapters, um, Feyerabend is attempting to sort of wrap up the main argument of the first um, part of the book, right? Really the, the, the primary focus of the book, um, which is the argument against method, right? Against the notion that there's a single scientific method that unites all of the diverse activities that we call science. Um, and uh, he's trying to do so in, uh, by, by responding to some ideas um, that might be used against the main part of his argument, right? So just to remind you, the main part of Feyerabend's argument against method um, stems from, on the one hand, the Galileo case. Galileo violates a variety of empiricist um, uh, prescriptions uh, of, of scientific method um, uh, by using, by, by essentially using what Feyerabend calls counterinductive approaches. Um, and Feyerabend also provides um, sort of scaffolding or um, uh, supplementary theoretical uh, abstract arguments that go along with the historical arguments um, that this is a reasonable set of things for, for Galileo to do. I mean, and in the background, of course, is the idea that Galileo is an important figure in modern science. And so um, we should regard um, sort of by default the things that Galileo was doing as um, at least permissible aspects of science, if not exemplary. Right? Um, so in chapter 15, Feyerabend uh, considers uh, some, some, um, uh, some responses to his, his argument. The main one is based in um, a classic logical empiricist distinction between the context of discovery and the context of justification. So the context of discovery is supposed to be that um, part of science where um, uh, scientists discover new phenomena, pose new theories, come up with new theories, and do all of the messy things that scientists do to, um, to arrive at their, at their ideas and conclusions. And then the context of justification is supposed to be that part of science where those, um, those results, those theories, hypotheses, um, are logically justified on the basis of the evidence that is gathered. Now, many thinkers uh, um, and at Feyerabend's time and since have questioned this distinction between the context of discovery and the context of justification. And Feyerabend is, is, no, difference, is no different here. Um, and he, he largely points to the fact that these processes are entangled in practice, right? as the main argument. Um, but he also points out, as he's done throughout the book, that the strict sort of application of the methods that are supposed to apply just to the context of justification um, would still wipe out uh, broad swaths of science, including, including Galileo's innovations, right? The, 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 the practical impossibility of, of making the distinction um, the overly restrictive notions of what happens in the context of discovery and, um, uh, and also the, the, the need for the close interaction between the two in order to criticize abstract uh, uh, theories of method uh, is uh, they're all parts of Feyerabend's argument against this distinction. Um, now there is, I think, a, a distinction in the neighborhood that's relevant to think about um, I wouldn't call it the context of discovery versus justification, but there is um, there are two processes that tend uh, to be somewhat separable in science, and that's what you might call the context of inquiry, when a scientist or more likely a team of researchers in a laboratory um, uh, conduct experiments, propose theories, um, and, and then publish their results. And then the context of certification, where those, those um, publications are peer-reviewed, um, published, and then 
uh, potentially taken up by other members of the scientific community. Um, so I think that there is an interesting difference there, but it's not one that lines up with the with the philosopher's attempt to draw a difference between the the, histor the historical process, the messy history of science that happens in the context of discovery, um, and the philosophically interesting uh, process of justification. Um, justification happens in both of the, the real world context of inquiry and the context of credibility. In attempting to uh, oppose the context distinction, Feyerabend also raises uh, uh, objection to a similar distinction between um, prescription and description. He's particularly thinking of methodological prescription for science and historical description of how science actually works. Um, now, I, I mean, I think Feyerabend doesn't mean to say that um, uh, there's, there's no meaningful distinction to be had there. Rather, what I think um, Feyerabend says is that there's an important way in which the descriptive and the prescriptive interact, right? So, so um, philosophical prescriptions are tested in the history of science and by the history of science, in a sense, um, and uh, uh, there, there, um, there are important ways in which not only can you criticize happenings in the history of science based on methodological prescriptions, you can criticize methodological prescriptions as unrealistic or inapplicable or, or irrelevant by looking at how they would work out in the history. Um, so if there, there's, of course, there is some kind of distinction between ought and is, um, but it's sort of, it's, it's not as fundamental as, you've, as some philosophers have led us to believe. Um, there's also a, a, a lengthy distinction, um, or a lengthy discussion, rather, of critical rationalism, which I won't try to repeat here. Um, but rather, I think what's, what's most interesting about it is the way in which Feyerabend talks about different conceptions of scientific progress from one theory to the next, right? Um, so he has this diagram. It's on page 159 in the fourth edition. Um, uh, it looks like this, right? Um, so uh, the, first, the, the, the top diagram here is sort of how Feyerabend thinks um, uh, we tend to think of, of um, the history of science, right? So we tend to think, you know, the old theory was okay, but it wasn't as good as the new theory. The new theory has increased content, uh, and, um, le and, and the relationship between the two is one of, of growth. The knowledge has increased, right? Um, but in fact, what Feyerabend points out is that this version of the old theory is kind of a fiction. It, it's kind of a, um, a construction from the perspective of the new theory. So the old theory wasn't, this isn't really what the old theory was. This is a version of the old theory, um, uh, which uh, has been kind of sanitized and rendered compatible with the new theory. Um, Another version of that uh, is one where we admit, okay, there were some things that the old theory got wrong, um, but still uh, there were parts that it got right, and the parts that it got right here are explained by the place of those sort of predictions in the new theory, right? Um, and so it's still, it's still a matter of empirical growth, right? Growth of empirical content. Right. Um, in fact, on fire oven's conception, it really works more like this. Right. Um, first, theories are much more open-ended on fire oven's conception. So, you know, we 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 know to some extent what the old theory and the new theory say, but they make a kind of open-ended. Uh, they have a kind of open-ended content, a kind of um, you know variety of different ways in which the basic commitments can be developed. Um, in, by further research. Um, so so the, the fact that they're not closed here um, in the diagram, that's what that represents is the open-endedness. Um, the other is that the, um, the shared content such as it is, is, is also kind of a, um, 
kind of a distortion, kind of a kind of a construction, right? So um, there is stuff that the old theory predicted um, that seemed fairly successful, and this gets shoehorned into the new theory. Um, but because in part of what Feyerman calls the incommensurability between the two theories, um, it's not, it's, it's, you know, the idea that it's shared content is a little bit of, of a fiction as well, right? Um, so, so, but the, and so, so what you have is sort of a, a, a replacement of the old theory by the new theory, some shared content, but only sort of, um, and uh, really it's, it's more of a replacement of focus and emphasis uh, going on there. Now I just used the word incommensurability. We've talked about it a little bit before, but this is really a major focus of these chapters. So let's talk about, let's talk about it for a moment. Incommensurability for Feyerabend um, uh, means to some extent incomparability, right? That's where the word comes from, right? So um, one of the original uses of the word, or the home uses of the word incommensurability is in mathematics um, to describe, for example, the relationship between the length of the side of a square and the length of a diagonal, okay? The, the length of the side of a square and the length of the diagonal are incommensurable in the sense that the length of the, the, length of the side of the square is one, right? The um, length of the diagonal is the square root of two. And there's no, there's no um, finite number or a decimal or a fraction that you can use to express those numbers in the same system, right? Um, if you switch to treating the diagonal as a whole number, then you're going to get an irrational number for the sides. Of course, they're comparable in a sense, like you can mark the you can mark the approximate um, lengths on one ruler and you can see one is long, longer than the other. They're comparable in that sense, but they're not rationally comparable. They're not, they can't be, um, uh, they can't be um, made part of the same sort of accounting system, right? Uh, insofar as that uh, uh, means, you know, having a finite representation. In the same in the same numerical um, system, right? Uh, so too, Feyerabend thinks that scientific theories are incommensurable, um, insofar as there's no rational, logical way to line up all of the concepts, um, uh, uh, laws, claims, predictions, um, evidence, experiments for one theory and another theory to to compare them one to one, right? the conceptual change that, that accompanies uh, the move from one theory to another means that there is some ambiguity, some slippage uh, between the two, right? Um, some change of not only theoretical, but also perceptual content. In fact, in these chapters, uh, Feyerabend tells us that it's not just that our perceptions or our um, observations are influenced by theory to some extent, they're, uh, they're, they're actually fully theoretical, right? Uh, observational claims are, f are fully um, uh, informed uh, by our, our theoretical commitments, right? We can, of course, within a framework on a pragmatic basis, distinguish between something that's an observation and something that's a theoretical claim, but there's no, um, there's no sort of in principle difference between, between the two, right? Um, uh, any, any kind of commitment is on the same ground as, as another kind of commitment. So um, that's incommensurability. Feyerabend tells us that incommensurability is a philosopher's problem, not so much a, a, not so much a scientific problem, right? It, it has to do with the way that philosophers want to rationally reconstruct, logically reconstruct scientific activity and not so much with um, the activities that actually scientists engage with. Scientists are more comfortable with ambiguity. They can make these comparisons just like a, a, an engineer, right, can compare the side and the diagonal of a square for length, right? Um, so it's a sort of artificial problem, um, but it is one that helps to undermine 
uh, rationalist conceptions of scientific method. Um, in chapter 16, uh, Feyerabend and has a very, a very long description of um, ancient cosmology. He's really uh, in the sense of the ancient worldview um, in relation to art, mythology, science, language. Um, and uh, his argument there is that one's conceptual system um, is uh, influential on what, not only one, what one believes about the world, but the way one sees the world, right? This sort of a, a, a tight connection between concepts and, and, and percept, conceptions and perceptions, right? Um, and so uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rather long description of that, but the, the key idea, I think, to, to connect it to scientific method, the key idea is um, that when you change from one theory to another, when you change from one uh, language to another, and all of these associated conceptual changes that go with that, to a certain extent, one is perceiving a different world. And the facts that one um, believes, right, the, 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 the be one, one's beliefs about what the evidence says, what the facts are, uh, will change. In, in effect, to use language from Thomas Kuhn, uh, when you move from one conceptual framework to another, you're, you're living in a different world. So, so that's, um, that's what's going on, I think, in this third part of the book. Um, uh, to sort of sum up, um, uh, you know, scientific practice is much more complex than the philosophical rationalist would have you believe. Um, uh, plurality, variety, um, uh, uh, creativity, you might say, um, uh, uh, complexity are all important parts of, of science. From the perspective of the philosophical rationalist, disorder and chaos are essential to knowledge and its progress, um, according to Feyerabend. Um, and the way to really understand science is to look at how it unfolds historically and um, uh, to, to, to some extent to give um, space for the scientist to um, proceed, proceed creatively um, uh, and you know, one of the—I mean, one of the things that Feyerabend I think is is trying to get us out of is 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 rigid conceptual systems that impede the progress of science. Right? That's that's a big part of what's going on in the first three quarters of the book. Um, part four, uh, we'll start to get outside of the of science per se, um, and and uh, into a broader view. Um, and, but we'll save that for the next video. All right. Uh, see you next time.